You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. Good evening. Welcome everyone to the Pan African Daily TV. Um, and this afternoon or morning or a night wherever you're connecting uh we are live tonight on the pan-african daily and first of all i want to apologize for yesterday our guest could not make it yesterday on time uh and i'm so tired and he did apologize for it so yesterday you knew we ought to have had al wahab farouk on the topic of the military takeover on the continent uh west african countries to be precise and but he will be catching up with those lectures and uh, next week he did send his apologies to uh, or on the behalf of the team of Pan-African and everyone that had been waiting to get him on the show. But tonight we have a very, very interesting guest. You all know him. Um, our brother Ebogna is not here for the first time, as you all know. And you know when he comes, there is fire in the house. Yes. We have to talk about very critical uh, issues. We talked already about the passation to the next generation in whatever form that we wanted to implement it. But I think uh, Brother Obi Ebuna has exactly the solution that he thinks if we start taking care of the younger generation, our children tonight, or uh, sorry, if we start taking care of them now, so we must have done a lot in the right of passation, you know, through history and education of our kids. So we'll also we'll be talking about that. But not apart from that, we also will be touching ground on the situation on the continent, like we talked about the conflicts in the Horn of Africa and also West African countries. So he will be telling us some very incredible work that he's been doing with his team out there in Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia, to be precise. And also, you know, the Cuba issue, the Cuba issue is also what um, his focus actually is on. But let me start by greeting all of you that are joining this conversation tonight. I know you did all miss us. You sent your feedback. And if you're here watching for the first time, you know what to do. Just click your notification bells because we will not be announcing to you when something goes wrong, right? So instead of you like what yesterday, finding out, oh, what's the issue? Some people were calling in. Are we okay? No, if we don't come live, please just trust everything is fine. When anything goes wrong, you will know. But if you click your notification bell, you don't have to worry anytime we come live, okay? So thank you so much. I must bring you an apology from Kofi Zuma, the, one of the permanent members in the house. He said he'll be joining us shortly. He just called, um, yeah, to confirm that. So I think we have a lot to digest today. Um, I want to sit back and relax and learn because uh, Brother Obi has been very, very influential and has been doing a lot, a lot. And he's been putting up projects and programs that are coming up already this Sunday. We have a lot to digest from him and his community today. As you can see, always very cool in his studio. Um, Brother Obi, how are you doing? I'm great. Um, how are you? Fine. We are so grateful to have you here on this second conversation. What is it that we'll be talking about uh, today or what is it that you want to inform us or to educate us about your projects? Um, what have you been doing? What are we going to mm -hmm. learn? What we, what well, we should be yeah. doing in the next well, weeks with you? <laughs> well, we're going to share um, the information. We're launching um, a historic effort with children um, this Saturday on the 29th something called the Mass Emphasis Children's History Education and Navigational Institute. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about um, our recent efforts to defend um, the territorial integrity of Eritrea. And um, we'll talk about a recent um, appeal we initiated in relationship to Cuba. 
And of course, um, quite naturally, um, you, you've asked us to touch a little bit on the developments in West Africa recently. So we'll do that. So that's what that would be the center of our conversation today, our exchange. Um, it is quite strange because we get these uh, disturbances coming, particularly from your end. We know it's not from the continent. We would have been blaming, you know, uh, electricity or power or in poor internet connection. Do you have the impression? Can you hear me well from your part? I can. I can definitely hear you. Right, but because when you're talking, there's some delays or yeah, some there's a, there, there's, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of a delay, but um, I can hear you though. Okay. All right. Fine. So what has been happening? Just go ahead. Uh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and um, start with Cuba because the last time that we were together, you um, attended the historic press conference that we had for the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations, His Excellency um, Pedro, Luis Pedroso Cuesta. And that was back in July. Mm. And um, he was touching on... Um, the vote at the United Nations last year, 154 nations against the monstrous genocidal white supremacist blockade, and only two nations in favor of it, the real nation's capital, the Zionist state of Israel, and the United States of America. And, and so he talked about that, and he talked about the fantastic work that they continue to do in the efforts to eradicate the genocidal pe corona pandemic. And um, as we know, in the last two years, Cuba is the only country in Latin America to have a vaccine manufacturer. And they've created four vaccinations, Sovereign One, Sovereign Two, Mambisa, and Abdallah. And um, the Mambisa, the Abdallah vaccination has a 92.8% effectiveness rate. And then after that, um, we facilitated a meeting between um, the Cuban ambassador to the United States, the first woman to ever hold that post, Ambassador Leonis Torres Rivera, and she met with the Director General of the World Conference of Mayors, Ambassador Johnny Ford. And they talked, we talked about our mayors in the United States and our community that have an African makeup, um, getting behind an effort to push for the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade to gain access to U.S. shores. And um, we are targeting a few nations in Africa, um, Guinea, Eritrea, Liberia, South, what's called South Africa, Zimbabwe, Ghana, and Nigeria. So we can look at um, helping um, support the medical efforts of Cuba in those particular um, nations. Because in addition to giving scholarships to students on the African continent to attend the Latin American School of Medical Sciences, when they go to the countries in Africa where they are, they have 4,000 they, 4, medical personnel dispersed throughout Africa they train the young people who make a commitment to remain in their countries and not continue to contribute to the brain drain. So um, that's that's been our work. And we submitted an appeal, and the appeal is called It's Seeking Restitution, Repair, and Redemption for the Cuban People in Defense of Their Homeland and Sovereignty. Um, what they've also asked for for the last six years, Comandante Fidel Castro put it on the table before he transitioned. Um, his brother, Comandante Raul Castro, um, put it on the table and presented it to President Obama. And the current president, um, His Excellency Miguel Diaz Canel, Cuba is seeking um, damages for the blockade, restitution. And um, so we are saying that we support that effort. And remember that we're um, last year was the 20th anniversary of the United Nations Conference in Durban, South, what's called South Africa. Um, dealing with um, racism, xenophobia, and other related intolerances 20 years ago. And one of the things that the Bush administration was in an uproar about was that Palestine would be on the agenda um, and our captivity, commonly referred to as child slavery, would be on the agenda and reparations would be on the agenda. But since we know that our people would disperse throughout the Americas, they were subjected to the same captivity. That's how we ended up in Cuba. That's how we ended up in Haiti. That's how we ended up in the Dominican Republic. So the effort to pan-Africanize the call for reparations and modernize it, because by Cuba calling for the damages dealing with the blockade, 
um, it's modernizing it because we cannot let imperialism, we cannot take them to task for the atrocities of yesterday at the expense of ignoring or diminishing the impact of the atrocities today. And when you look at the um, problems that the blockade has caused Cuba in terms of, even though they've been able to um, work with Venezuela on a project to eradicate blindness and glaucoma throughout the Americas, they're still using braille machines from the 50s. Even though they developed this vaccination, these vaccinations and being the only manu vaccine manufacturer in Latin America, they still had issues with syringes and other equipment being able to come into the country. This is some of the inconveniences that the blockade caused because it's not just aimed at stifling the economy and crushing the patriotism and spirit of the revolutionary spirit of the people, but it is to cause inconveniences and sabotages of daily infrastructure, the health infrastructure, the educational infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure. So it's, it's a very wicked way. And um, unfortunately, many people don't pay attention to the impact of sanctioning and blockading. We still look at conventional warfare and, it's, and we can understand why as African people, when you look at how many times Mother Africa has been bombed, when you look at how many times coups have been um, manipulated, when you look when you take a look at assassinations, um, it's understandable why we still focus on conventional warfare. But in the spirit of evolution, in the spirit of an enhanced collective understanding, we must understand how imperialism uses sanctions. So we're working with Winston Salem University, and uh, through their Africa World Now project to see if on Dr. King's assassination day on April 4th, we can have a forum there dealing with the role of sanctions in preventing peace, stability, and development from prevailing. And we would like the Cubans, since they are on Cuba as the current vice chair of the United Nations Committee on Special, Deve Special Committee on Decolonization. They are the current vice chair. So we're looking to see if we can use that platform and a university platform to bring attention to sanctions, especially to our young people. So we would like Cuba to participate. We're seeking the um, participation of our comrades in Zimbabwe because the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act was imposed by the Bush administration in 2001 as a vindictive response to defending the territorial integrity of the Congo and also dealing with the land reclamation program. We also want the Eritreans to be there because They've been under, they were under UN um, Security Council sanctions under a false claim, a false accusation that they were harboring terrorists from Al Shabaab. And then um, the sanctions lasted 10 years, even though Security Council sent an inspection team there and found out that the accusation was completely bogus. And of course, um, we want the Venezuelans to be there. So, because we know the role of Venezuela in pushing for this Afro descendant movement calling for Pan-African linkages in the Americas, where we no longer look at ourselves as Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Latino, African-American. We just say that we're African descendants. Mm -hmm. And um, so because of their role in doing that, the Biden administration, just like the Trump administration, has aggressively um, seek regime change in Venezuela. So we feel that Cuba, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, and Eritrea and Zimbabwe are the most qualified entities that are part of the African liberation struggle, part of the decolonization process, who can spread this message to the rest of our people all over the world about how genocidal sanctions by imperialism impede daily progress and compromise children, compromise women, compromise men, compromise health, compromise education, compromise architecture, comp compromise transportation, compromise roads, compromise homes, every basic part of life. So we feel that um, the resistance will intensify when our people recognize how deadly it this weapon is in the hands of our former captors and our colonizers. And we thank um, the platforms that we have been provided because of the work we're doing with Cuba to help this point hit home, both on the diaspora and on the continent as well. And the appeal that we did what we were so touched about is we got nine Cuban friendship associations in the Caribbean to sign on to this. And of course, um, I'm the external relations officer of the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association and the South African Cuba Friendship Association signed on to this. So um, 
And uh, it, so it made a very strong statement. It made a very strong, emphatic statement. And we were just happy that we were able to do this work. And this is the work that we were in pursuit of since we last saw you. So um, in relationship to Cuba, um, in relationship to the Ethiopian Eritrean situation, we strongly object to the propaganda by the Western world that suggests that this is just an issue dealing with Ethiopia. If there's a comparison to be made, you can look how a few years ago, the Trump administration blasted Cuba on a regular basis, blasted Venezuela on a regular basis. But when they were magnifying those uh, contradictions, when they were exposing their contradictions, exposing their hypocrisy, they were able to overthrow the democratically elected revolutionary government of our indigenous brother and comrade in Bolivia, Evo Morales. And we feel that in, in the, using that same methodology, they wanted to put so much focus on Ethiopia, so much for, and or when they would talk regionally and they would refer to the dynamics going on in the Horn of Africa, but their number one goal was to overthrow the revolutionary government of Eritrea under Isaias F. Werke, the only nation on the African continent at the moment giving the people free education from pre-kindergarten to the PhD level, free health care for the people. The, the first country in Africa, the first country in the so-called developed world to expel the United States Agency for International Development from their country as early as 2005, because they are very um, aware of how imperialism uses humanitarian aid for bribery and intimidation purposes. So um, we watched the um, one of the key members of the Congressional International Relations Committee, Karen Bass, a woman of um, African ancestry, how she's being used as the main mouthpiece and the main um, engineer of this process. She had a meeting with the chair of the African Union, the president of the DRC, in front of the US Institute for Peace. And she claimed that she had met with some um, Ethiopians who were calling for US military intervention. That is completely false because if you've been following this issue in the diaspora, if you've been following it in Europe, if you've been following it in Washington, you know that the Ethiopian and Eritrean communities in the diaspora have formed a diplomatic task force. And the reason that they formed that diplomatic task force was to send an emphatic statement to the West that the peace agreement that they initiated three years ago is intact. They support it all the way across the spectrum. And it also sends an emphatic statement to imperialism that we are capable in Africa of working out our own political differences, resolving our own political tensions without the interference of our former colonizers and captors. So whoever she talked to represented the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, which is partnering with the Biden administration in the tradition of mercenaries, in the tradition of scapegoats, in the tradition of trigger-happy neo-colonialists to bring about regime change both in Ethiopia and Eritrea. You must also understand that um, Ethiopia has a woman president at the time and has their first Oroman, Oromian prime minister in modern history in that country. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the president of Eritrea should have gotten it too because it takes two to negotiate a peace accord of that magnitude. So it shows you that the legitimate aspirations of the Ethiopian and Eritrean people deal with peace, deal with stability. They learned from the Igbo Biafran War in Nigeria, which left one million of us dead in the streets. They learned from the Hutsis and Tutsis in Rwanda. They learned from very similar conflicts in Africa. And it was Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah that told us in his book, Class Struggle in Africa, to clearly distinguish between tribal politics and tribalism. Tribal politics is when people, regardless of their nation, we don't even use the word tribes because that suggests that we're pr primitive politically, primitive intellectually. But our nations are we encourage the highest level of political participation and patriotism amongst all nations within our nation. But what we don't want is divides perpetuated.
So the Ethiopians and Eritreans have given the African continent a high level, sophisticated, favorable, advantageous illustration of how to do this. The same way that the Zimbabweans a few years ago had a global political agreement. And even though the movement for democratic change was financed by the British, financed by, the, by Washington to come into existence, they had to submit to the culture of unity in Zimbabwe and sit down with ZANU-PF and agree to a power sharing agreement. So this peace accord in Ethiopia, between the Ethiopians and Eritreans is equally as valuable. And the last time we saw something like this in the Eastern region in Africa was way back in the 1990s, when in Ethiopia, the Somali National Democratic Union, the Somali National Alliance, and the Somali Salvation Democratic Front had a meeting to form a, um, a umbrella so they would not be escalated political conflict that our former colonizers could manipulate to advance neo-colonialism on the African continent. And of course, because of the relationship of the United States Africa Military Command in relationship to East African politics, its main outlet on the continent is in Djibouti. So we understand them trying to turn the tide back because in the 1990s, we made an emphatic statement to the world. We don't want military neocolonialism in Africa anymore. No more Mobutus, no more Bukasas, no more um, Babangadas, no more Abachas. The people went to the streets and said, we don't want military neocolonialism. Unfortunately, many accepted civilian neocolonialism as a step in the right direction, but we don't want any form of neocolonialism. So what you're seeing in Burkina Faso, what you're seeing in Mali, once again, is the people saying they don't want military neocolonialism. When mm -hmm. Thomas Sankara was assassinated in 1987 by Blair Compré, working for the French, working with Houphouët Boigny, working with the CIA, the people of Burkina Faso have been subjected to military neocolonialism up until a few years ago. They don't want to go back. We don't want our politics policed. We don't want our economic activity policed. We don't want our social activity policed. So when we say we don't want to be policed in Minnesota um, and gunned down like George or choked to death like George Floyd was or gunned down every 28 hours like our sisters and brothers in the United States are, thanks to the Malcolm X grassroots movement for doing that information and sharing it with the broader community, we don't want imperialism policing us anywhere in Africa. But we understand in West Africa that has become a it's part of the political culture this military neo-colonialist culture, and they won't let it die. That's what Buhari represents in Nigeria. That's what um, the majority of African content countries. As a matter of fact, in the West African nations, if you go to the universities in the United States and you go to the business departments, you will hear people openly say they want to set up a business, they want to buy influence into the militaries, and they want to use that to ascend to power in their countries. That has become the perception of how we bring about change, how we get involved in politics in the first place. And if you let your politics be dictated by military leaders who have don't have ideological training, don't have ideological direction, you're going to get more compres, you're going to get more bukasas, you're going to get more mobutus, you're going to get more Samuel Doe's. This is what you can expect. And Africa has made an emphatic statement. They do not want to do that. Now, we make a distinction. But with that being said, we have had some great fighters in, our, in the revolutionary process that had a military background. Gamal Abdul Nasser had a military background, revolutionary. Ahmed Ben Bella had a revolutionary background. He was military. Thomas Sankara had a military background, but he was truly revolutionary. So if we're saying if you have Josiah Tongogara, who led the armed struggle in Zimbabwe, had a military background, but is arguably the most strongest, most dedicated, most disciplined revolutionary that the second Chimurenga in Zimbabwe produced. So if people come through military ranks, as long as they don't try to militarize the politics of the people, the politics of the political parties, the politics of the political process. Because since this is the 100th anniversary of Akme Sekou Toure, who was the first leader in Africa to institute the people's militia, 
where he armed the whole entire nation. He armed the Mandingos. He armed the Susus. He armed the Fulanis. So we, we say the people must be the armies. The people must be the soldiers. Nobody can defend the nation better than the people. But you have to have a level of trust, a level of discipline, a level of unity, and a level of commitment to a revolutionary ideology to even embark on a project of that magnitude. But that is what the climate at this historical moment dictates that we must do. So we will police ourselves, we will protect ourselves, but we also have to deal with the fact that imperialism depends on um, Africa, the Caribbean and Latin America militarizing and weaponizing our communities. So in the same way you hear people in the United States saying they want to defund the police, that is a um, step in the right direction. But ultimately we want to de-weaponize the police. When I graduated from high school in 1987, not one police officer, Sister Tata, in the United States of America carried a semi-automatic weapon. By the time I graduated from college, security guards at grocery stores and banks had semi-automatic weapons. So imperialism's goal is through the weapon industry. They want to militarize places where they control the political climate so they can ensure that the people who they want to impose neocolonialism through are able to do it with a gun. Because the only way you can impose neocolonialism is through a gun. You can't impose it through an authentic ballot. You can't impose it through the culture because we're resisting it more than ever before. So we'll fight it any way we have to. If we have to fight it with guns, we will. If we have to fight it with sticks and stones and slingshots like the Palestinians do, we will. If we have to fight it through education, we will. If we have to fight it through the arts, we will. If we have to fight it through journalism, we will. And the way things look, we have to fight it on all fronts. So we have to get prepared for that fight. The fight to end neocolonialism in any of its manifestations is the number one goal in Africa. And you even see people paying lip service to Pan-Africanism, and many of them aren't doing anything but Pan-Africanizing neocolonialism. When Hufed Boini allowed Jonas Savimbi to fly back into Angola using his private jet, that's, a, that's Pan-African, but it's Pan-Africanizing neocolonialism. When Karen Bass, representing the U.S. Congress, the former U.S. Assistant of Secretary Affairs under Bush, Constance Barry Newman, and Johnny Carson, former Assistant Secretary for African Affairs under Obama, and he was also the U.S. ambassador to Zimbabwe and Ellen Johnson Salif, former president of Liberia. When they fly back to Zimbabwe to monitor the elections, that delegation is Pan-African, but it was to bring about neocolonialism through the ballot and they were not successful. So we're clear enough to see that even neocolonialists are trying to use Pan-African methodology to make it seem like Pan-Africanism represents neocolonialism. You can even look at the year of return in Ghana where Akufa Ado's family, his uncle, formed the first um, opposition party to Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and worked with the British and worked with the United States, worked with the Johnson administration to overthrow Nkrumah. But now he's benefiting from a tactic that Nkrumah instituted at the advice of Shirley Graham Du Bois, that great Pan-African giant, to bring a diasporan-based community back to the continent to work on the ground. And this is how Maya Angelou got to Ghana. This is how Tom Feelings got to Ghana. This is how Julian Mayfield got to Ghana. This is how Preston King got to Ghana. But now he's higher, but now he's um, linking up with people like that promote neocolonialism, like Rosa Whitaker, who wrote the Growth African Growth and Opportunity Act to make to help the Corporate Council on Africa and the Council on Foreign Relations and other Fortune 500 companies continue to pick the bones of Africa, pick the bones and continue to rape our resources and to continue to extract our human resources to the wealth to continue the cyclical drain, the brain drain is what I'm talking about. So we're witnessing the pan-Africanizing of neocolonialism. And to all your listeners who may not know this, to all your viewers who may not know this, we take it back to Ghana. When Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah wrote the book, Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism in 1964, <laughs> the Johnson administration had on the books $33 million for Ghana in humanitarian aid. And they told him if the book gets published, he can forget about that aid. 
but he chose what was best for Africa and he put the book out. So they've been using humanitarian aid as a form of bribery since the 1960s, shortly after the independence process began to take its course. So it is nothing new. So we'll fight neocolonialism on all fronts, on the continent and off the continent. So that's what that's basically what we're dealing with. Wow. Um, a lot of people have been saying, even the Pan-African uh, Pan-Africanism that we're talking about now, exactly the point that you nailed on, before we know it, is going to be institutionalized by others, particularly what we're lobbying for. In the mm -hmm. in the shortest time, you're going to see people that are speaking in, you know, like want to speak for it, but as a matter of fact, most of them are just on or defending other agendas. So how do we pay attention to this? How do we, we know the difference? By the work we do, by, how, by what the work looks like, the targets of the work. See, mm -hmm. when you articulate ideas, it's, it's easy to camouflage what you want to do on a methodological level. This is why Nkrumah told us, he said, practice without thought is blind, thought without action is empty. Our activity um, deals with it. And as a matter of fact, revolutionary activity um, is, has driven just about everything we see. I'll give you an example. In 1990, at the end of 1990 in Tripoli, Libya, when uh, the great Gaddafi was still amongst us, you had a meeting to establish a worldwide African anti-Zionist front. This was in 1990. 11 years later, there's a meeting in Durban, South Africa, once the Bush administration says Palestine can't come. And now everybody's coming talking about Palestine. But I can tell you in 1990, many people did not want to confront the issue of Zionism. And we were saying then, as young people, Zionism is a direct enemy of Africa. Palestinian solidarity is just the tip of the iceberg. Wasn't it Israel that said that Algeria did not recognize Algeria's self-determination in the 1960s and Tunisia's um, self-determination in the 1960s? Wasn't it, wasn't it Israel that supported German colonialism in Namibia, Portuguese colonialism in Mozambique and Angola and Guinea-Bissau? Wasn't it Israel that supported um, apartheid in what's called South Africa? And so now, even when you hear people saying uh, they shouldn't have their observer status at the uh, um, African Union anymore. They had it for many years under the OAU. Where were these voices then? And not only that, even if we get them, Sister Tata, to be removed from the African Union observer status seat, which is one of our demands, but we're saying that Cuba should get, assume that seat because Cuba is proven in Africa. But more important than that, what difference would it make if you strip them of their observer status at the United Nations, I mean, at the African Union, but 46 of the 55 African nations have normalized relations with Israel, meaning it's an Israeli embassy in 46 of the 55 African nations we have. You understand what I'm saying? So what you'll see is sometimes people will deal with the issue on the surface. Even because of the work of revolutionary forces, small, overlooked, underground for more all intended purposes, the whole world is against the blockade on Cuba. These neo-colonialist governments in Africa, like clockwork, vote every year against that blockade. That's because of the work we do on a daily basis. We're not saying we want credit for the work, but we understand climate. We understand atmosphere. We understand milieu. So what will happen is they may be cases based on conditions that we have forced, that our most ruthless enemies will have to acquiesce to some of our objectives and some of our authentic demands. But we will not be fooled by any masquerades. We will not be fooled by any masquerades. We won't be deceived at all. And we will follow people's consistent track records. But our activity will clear the smoke screen. As time goes on, you will continue to see. And ultimately, what I think will be the deciding factor, you hear many people um, talk about pan their Pan-African conferences all the time, Pan-African conventions all the time. And the most quoted person, the most mentioned person is Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. But you will notice that many of these people who talk about him and they'll they'll come back and say they're against socialism. He said that socialism and African unity are organically complementary. Not Marxism Leninism per se, not Maoism per se. He he said in his book Consciencism, he said Africa will have its own ideology, and he said that socialism finds its roots in communalism. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and capitalism finds its roots in feudalism. So one of the worst things that colonialism and captivity impeded in Africa, it interrupted a class struggle we were having amongst ourselves. We would have had to go to war with Mansa Musa if it wasn't for the Europeans and the Arabs. We would have had to go to war with all of the dynasties, the kings and the queens, because they decided that the wealth should be occupied by them and not the masses of the people. So we were having that fight for the wealth of Africa before the first European and the first Mm. Arab ever touched ground in Africa. And Mm. now we want and now we want all outsiders out of our business so we can continue that class struggle. We'll just pick up where we left off because many of the chiefs exploit their um, behind traditions, exploit women, exploit Mm. the wealth. And they think Mm. and as a matter of fact, they are four hundred and nine million Africans that live on a dollar 90 cents a day or less. Agenda 22 is not set up to deal, Agenda 2063 is not set up to deal with that. How can we focus on 2063 when four children die of starvation every hour? How can we focus on Agenda 2063 where in 2022 of the uh, 25 nations that are the poorest in the world, 23 of them are African? Of the 609 million people uh, and 25 million people down from 784 million people last year, 9 million people have been added to the list. It was 400 million people last year living on $1.90 a day on the continent of Africa. And in the United States, we're 21% of the poor, even though we're only 12% of the population. So the U.S. born African, the North American born African, your only claim is that you're the most comfortably exploited person on earth, the most comfortably dehumanized person on earth. And um, the reason, so, so these contradictions will come up. So when you hear people say that socialism is a white man's idea, we were practicing communalism before Marx's great grandmother held and great grandfather held hands and kissed for the first time. That's our culture that we're talking about. And the only reason we may use that language and then people will say, I had this conversation with Dr. Leonard Jeffries before, and he was saying, if you read in Krumah's autobiography, he said he's a Marxist and a Christian. I said at that point, but by the time he wrote Consciencism and I said in Krumah, reading Marx, Sekou Touré, reading Marx, Emile Cabral, reading Marx and Lenin, Samora Marshall, reading Marx and Lenin, Mugabe, reading Marx and Lenin, is no different than Thurgood Marshall reading Jefferson and Lincoln and Washington when talking about learning the law and using U.S. law as a weapon in our resistance. So if we, and since, and since we, um, So we've had to use the same way that in the 1940s at Fort Hare University in what's called South Africa, the people who ended up initiating armed struggles all throughout Southern Africa were at Fort Hare University reading Gandhi. So they went from Gandhi in the 40s to armed struggles in the 60s. So as you evolve, as you grow, as you mature, you use all type of research, all type of information, all type of data to get a heightened understanding. But we now know that we must look to our culture first. This is why we say when they talk about Dr. King and they are quick to tell you, oh, Gandhi shaped his view, Thoreau shaped his view, Emerson shaped his view. We say, no, 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 no. He invited Nkrumah to Gan to, to he invited um, Dr. King to the um, independence celebration. And whenever they talk about Dr. King's influences, they exclude Nkrumah. But Dr. King told Nkrumah, we use nonviolence and people didn't ride the buses for 384 days. You took those same tactics and you chased the British out of your country. The same way Sekou Touré did it in Guinea, the same way Lumumba did it in the Congo, the same way Gaddafi did it in Libya. So we know when we have more education, more history, more knowledge of our resistance, we will see how there were times where we use language of the oppressor to turn it into a weapon for the oppressed. That's just the natural decolonization process taking its course. So don't use Nkrumah reading Marx as a young man, Sekou Touré using Marx as a young man to say that socialism isn't going to work for the African continent. That's just an excuse. And that's intellectual dishonesty at the highest level, the highest level. So um, we're we're coming around to do, and we will deal with all of our contradictions. 
And we just have to get ready for class struggle. That's all. Some people have ruling class values. Some people have working class values. When you have ruling class values, you'll exploit anyone, anywhere, anytime. When you have working class values, you won't live if anyone who looks like you is exploited anywhere. It is, is it for you to just break down when you mean um, what you um, um, Kwame Nkrumah said, or the other said that socialism uh, doesn't fit into the culture. What do you actually mean? Just break it down for a common. Well, what 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 they're what they're saying is um, what they're saying is because at one point in his development, he 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 referenced Marx, he referenced Lenin, he referenced Engels. They'll take like um, one of those phrases and one of those quotes and make it seem like for all of his life, he mm -hmm. honored, he that that's where he he was. He restricted himself. So he wrote his autobiography in the 1950s. But by the time he wrote a book called Consciences and Philosophy and Ideology for Decolonization, he let it be known where Marx puts the emphasis on economics. He puts the emphasis on politics. So he went beyond Marx and he developed an ideology tailored for, specific for the African personality and the African continent and the African diaspora. And that is what the effort to build the All African People's Revolutionary Party has been all about, which is the party that he called for in the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. But it's just that people who really haven't studied him beyond the surface and have conveniently extracted different aspects of things, because really what it is, is they're against socialism in any form, anywhere Africans are calling for it. They talk about racism in Cuba as though the Cubans deny, but the Cubans just say the racism there is a carryover over from captivity and colonialism. It's not because of the policies initiated by the revolutionary process. They've done everything to eradicate racism, but the attack on Cuba is really an attack on socialism because as long as Cuba maintains, it is an example to the rest of the world about the power about socialism. And it makes those Africans on the continent more interested in Nkrumah than ever before, hungry to read his books, hungry to read Sekou books as he turns 100 this year, hungry to learn about Mangalizo Subukwe, hungry to learn about Mugabe, hungry to learn about Augustino Nito. They're gonna be able to look at those examples. They're gonna be able to look at those liberation movements and say, how can you claim to be on the continuation of that path when what you're calling for is in diametrical opposition to that? So we'll automatically put those who are masqueraders that you're talking about on notice. And that's what they are trembling in their boots about, but it is the inevitable. We're going to get back to what works for us because at the end of the day, you could talk about what you're against all day long, but you're measured by what you fight for. You're measured by what you're willing to put your life on the line for, what you strive for. And you can't tell people to strive for something if they don't see you striving for it yourself. And also we have help. The whole world, because of the, the, the division, you have um, 2,755 billionaires and you have um, 2,755 people, individuals, worth $13 trillion, and you have nearly 800 million people on the verge of starvation and death. That is the widest gap between the wealthy and the poor in the history of humanity. Something has to give. And Africa, the most raped, the most pillared, the most plundered, the most exploited continent of them all, has something to say about the change and the trajectory. And the most authentic expressions come from the most exploited. That is a constant in history. And it's not going to be any different this time. So we are clearly letting it be known where we, uh, where we sit. We're not fighting against racism to benefit from capitalism. That is not our fight at all. We're, not try we're, not, we're telling our children um, it's better to be like Modibo Keita than to be like Mansa Musa. We're telling our children it's better to be like Nkrumah and better to be like Sekou than any of these kings and queens that Ebony Magazine used to showcase. It's better to be like Josina Marshall and Sally Mugabe than any of the queens. It's better to be a comrade. It's better to be a fighter. It's better to be an agent of change, fundamental change. 
it's it's better to be an agent that transforms the landscape so future generations can get what's inherently theirs. That's sure. So that's that's just how we feel about that. And that's so our work in Cuba represents that. Our work around Eritrea represents that. Our work in Zimbabwe represents that. Controlling what is inherently ours and rescuing it from those who seek to conquer it or maintain domination over it and over us. So identifying with those who truly represent the fighting spirit as opposed to those who represent capitulation. So what we're talking, and the reason that we're targeting our children, let's get to that, is because we want to transform this island of black excellence into a training ground for African resistance. And if that's too hot to handle, then we recommend one-way tickets to Wakanda or Zamunda. You don't want to be around this fight when it happens. You don't want to be around this explosion when it happens. So this Saturday, we have um, what's called the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company. That has been in existence since 2010. Mm. 2011, I'm sorry. 2011. Um, 2011. And we've done um, 23 plays and we've written 27. Four of them will be performed. I'll get to the catalog in a second. So after that, we realized that when you look at the history, our illustrious history of struggle and resistance, many of our great fighters weren't just driven by their ideology. It wasn't just about their ideology, their conviction to principles that we admire them. They utilize unique skill sets and talents to advance the revolutionary process. Emilcar Cabral enhanced the revolutionary process in Guinea-Bissau through agronomy. He was an agronomist. Samora Marshall was a nurse. Mm -hmm. Mugabe's a teacher. Sabukwe is a teacher. Chitepo is a lawyer. So what we're saying to our young people is, if you're going to be teachers, if you're going to be lawyers, if you're going to be architects, if you're going to, Franz Fanon was a doctor, Augustino Nito, doctor. So if you're going to be a doctor, this is the type of doctor we want you to be. Every Zimbabwean that wants to be a doctor should follow the example of Samuel Paranyatwa, who was Joshua Nkomo's number two in Zapu and was assassinated by the British and the Rhodesians in 1961. So this is all we're saying. And so we would like our, Ida B. Wells was a journalist of the highest order. Daisy Bates was a journalist. If you're going to be a if you're if you're going to be a reverend, you say that you've been called to the cloth. Be one like John Chilimbwe, who took up arms with the people in Malawi in 1915. Be a Christian like Dr. King. As long as you have the fighting spirit, it doesn't matter what your revel, your um, individual spiritual practice is. Christians like Nkrumah, Christians like King, Christians like Chilimbwe, Christians like Eduardo Monlane, Christians like Mugabe, Muslims like Sekou Toure, Muslims like Malcolm X, those are the type of people. So your spiritual practice is your individual decision, but your commitment to revolutionary advancement is what history obligates all of us to do. So through this mass emphasis children's history, education and navigational institute, we're going to be teaching young people between the ages of 9 and 13 and 14 and 18 on Saturdays. That will be um, 3 to 4 p.m. East Coast time, Washington, D.C., United States, and um, 4 to 5 for the 14 to 18-year-olds. And we're also teaching a class to some students in Alberta, Canada from 5 to 6 p.m. East Coast time, a bunch of French-speaking Africans. So the first thing when we teach children we developed a letter number formula um, using letters and numbers to teach them the African continental landscape. So the formula mm -hmm. goes like this, A2, B4, C7, D2, E4, G5, K1, L3, M7, N3, R1, S10, T3, U1, Z2, or Z2 as you say in Africa. And if you wonder, what did I just do? There are two nations in Africa that begin with the letter A, four that begin with the letter B, seven that begin with the letter C, so on and so on. So through that, they learn to memorize in alphabetical order every African nation. And we adjust the changes. Mm -hmm. We know that Swaziland is now East Watini, so we take care of that. Then we teach them all the flags of all the African nations. So they'll be able within a month to, to you can just show them the flag of Rwanda, they'll tell you show you the flag of Burkina Faso, show you the flag of Seashell, show you the flag of Uganda, show you the flag of Namibia, show you the flag of the Central African Republic, 
show you the flag of Sao Tome and Principe. That's what they'll be able to do. We also give them the truth about Pan-Africanism. Some people, Sister Tata, going back to what you talked about earlier, they assume that Pan-Africanism deals with the continent of Africa exclusively. Pan means all. Uh, so it means Africans yeah. everywhere. The 55, yes. nation, the 55 nations we call home, they'll learn about the Africans in Australia who've been there for 80,000 years. They'll learn about the 175 million Africans in India, the 90 million Africans in Pakistan, the Africans all over Europe, the 200 million Africans in the Americas. As a matter of fact, we challenge Mr. Biden's definition of America, which is a fascist genocidal definition. We want to know about the African in South America, the African in Central America, the African in um, the Caribbean, the African throughout the Western Hemisphere. And this mm -hmm. is what it deals with. We'll use poetry. We'll, as a matter of fact, the first thing that we teach them the very first day is that Africans, even though our ancestors created 5,000 languages since the beginning of time, we communicate primarily in seven, English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, German, Italian, and Arabic. But we use those languages as weapons to unite. And so we have a poem that we um, teach the children called the language poem. With your permission, I'd like to do it. It's not that long. Go ahead. Go ahead, go yeah, ahead. The poem, the poem is called The Language Poem, and we created this in 2010 for children six years old and up. This is what we're gonna teach the children. Africans in the US are English-speaking Africans. Africans in Jamaica are English-speaking Africans. Africans in, in um, Trinidad are English-speaking Africans. Just like Africans who live in Ghana, just like Africans who live in Kenya, just like Africans who live in Zimbabwe. English-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Haiti are fr French-speaking Africans. Africans in Martinique are French-speaking Africans. Just like Africans who live in Algeria, just like Africans who live in Guinea, just like Africans who live in the Congo. French-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Cuba are Spanish-speaking Africans. Africans in Colombia are Spanish-speaking Africans. Africans in Venezuela are Spanish-speaking Africans. Just like Africans who live in Equatorial Guinea, Spanish-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. Africans in Brazil are Portuguese-speaking Africans. Just like Africans who live in Angola, just like Africans who live in Mozambique, just like Africans who live in Guinea-Bissau, Portuguese-speaking Africans are still Africans, no doubt about it. We're all Africans, we're all Africans, we're all Africans. Learn to celebrate it, learn to explain it, learn to defend it. That's the point. And what we do, if you paid attention to the pattern of the poem, we start with diasporic nations and then we deal with the continental nations. And the purpose is, if I, because I speak English, I can learn Igbo, I can learn Yoruba, I can learn in, Niger, in Nigeria, I can learn Shona, Debele, and Tonga in Zimbabwe. I can learn Swahili in Kenya, and Uganda, because I speak English, because that's who colonized them. The African in Haiti can learn Lingala in the Congo, can learn Susu and Fulani and Mandingo in Guinea because they speak French. So that will deal with the linguistics. But also the African in the United States can learn the, the, ch the African child of the United States can learn the history of Africans in Jamaica the history of Africans in Trinidad, the, the history of Africans in Ghana, the history of Africans in Kenya, Africans in Uganda, Africans in Zimbabwe, wherever English is spoken. The African in Brazil can learn the history of Angola, the history of Guinea-Bissau, the history of Mozambique, because the Portuguese colonized all four groups. The African, Spanish-speaking Africans in Cuba can learn about Africans in Colombia, where there are 11 million of us, they can learn about Africans in Venezuela. They can learn about Africans in Equatorial Guinea because they speak Spanish. The most important writings about the African personality and the collective experience at this point have been written in colonial languages. But the day will come where we will be able to write them in our languages. So our goal is to teach these young people to seek their history, to digest their history, and to share their history. So this process we're not teaching to the children, we're teaching through the children. Through mm -hmm. the children, their parents will learn more than they've ever known about African history. Their grandparents will learn more than they've ever learned. And 
what they will also discover through this process is the child has the ability and the responsibility to transmit knowledge just like an adult does and they will learn when they encounter people twice their age who have been blessed enough and fortunate enough to be exposed to what they're learning they will learn from those communities they will learn from that demographic in their community that they are getting the exposure to this history at a much earlier age so this is our goal our goal is to not complain about um the schools in the united states the schools in latin america the schools in the caribbean even the schools in neo-colonialist africa you think they I know of one school and my comrade Akili Seka set it up. I'll introduce you to him so you could get him on the show. It's the only school in Ghana where Nkrumah's books are the underbelly of the curriculum. But if you think, don't assume that in Ghana, Nkrumah's books are in the schools. Don't mm -hmm. assume in Guinea that Sekutere's books are in the schools. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that Thomas Ankara's books are in Burkina Faso and his speeches. Mm -hmm. That's something that we're going to have to fight for. But it's no coincidence that at every phase of our struggle, education has elevated and intensified the resistance. Brown versus Board of Education heightened the civil rights and human rights struggle in the United States. The Soweto uprising intensified the struggle against apartheid. Because education is a fundamental right. And even right now at this historical moment, because of African resistance and other oppressed people's resistance, it has forced imperialism to come up with what they call sustainable development goals. Doesn't every country now have a mandate to deal with clean water? Doesn't mm -hmm. every country now have a mandate to deal with housing? Doesn't mm -hmm. every country have a mandate to deal with health care and education? Do you think that the imperialists just woke up in a cold sweat guilty for their crimes against humanity? No, that is because of every drop of blood that Africans have shed, every drop of blood that Asians have shed and Latin Americans have shed and blood we have shed in those places to make the world a better place. So every time we talk about the African personality and talk about our history and others will say, well, what about other people's history? If the most oppressed people on earth are liberated, humanity's standards have automatically been elevated. That's what we're going to get the children to tell anyone that tells them, well, what about Asian history? What about European history? Don't restrict yourself to your history. Especially in our case, that's all we've ever learned. We know more about Beethoven and Chopin and Mozart and Stravinsky than we know about Duke Ellington, than we know about Louis Armstrong then we know about Fela Kuti, then we know about E.T. Mensa, then we know about Marion Makiba or Dorothy Masika or um, Lita Mbulu. That's not a coincidence. So the point is, we accept the challenge. And one of the most beautiful characteristics of history itself is the challenges that it imposes. These children will learn that the best way to gauge the quality of a contribution that one will make towards history is by the interpretation of history. We're going to teach these children that the time has come, our community, the time has come to treat um, social science with the same respect you treat natural science and mathematics. You don't say two plus two is seven because it feels good. You don't go to the periodic chart and say L is uh, and say um, O is for hydrogen because you felt like saying that. You have to prove. You must provide scientific proof. You must provide mathematical proof when you deal with calculus, when you deal with algebra, when you deal with trigonometry. Why, do, why are we so casual when it comes to our history? Why do we let people lie about Nkrumah, lie about Biko, lie about Josina Marshall, lie about Asada Shakur, lie about Free Limo, lie about ZANU PF, lie about the Black Panther Party, lie about the NAACP? No. The history must be accurate and we must reach a point of maturity. Give credit to people, even if you don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. The main organization attacked in our community and criticized in our community is the NAACP, Sister Tata. But you know what? No mm -hmm. organization has produced more fighters. Ella Baker comes from the NAACP. James Weldon Johnson, who wrote Lift Every Voice and Sing, comes from the NAACP. Du Bois, NAACP. Ida Wells, NAACP. Charles Hamilton Houston, who taught Thurgood Marshall the law, NAACP. Thurgood Marshall, NAACP. Rosa Parks, NAACP. 
So if we are concerned about some of the, the strategic moves they make or some of the things they articulate ideologically, that should not be done at the expense of not giving them credit for what they've contributed to our struggle. Because one of the things that we can do, the privilege of life is, if you take life seriously, the most valuable aspect of life for a fighter, for a frontline servant, is you live long enough to correct the mistakes of those you agree with and those you disagree with. Mm. I want to correct any mistake Malcolm X made. I want to correct any mistake Malcolm Martin Luther King made, any mistake Robert Mugabe made, any mistake Patrice Lumumba made, any mistake Muammar Gaddafi made, any mistake Nkrumah made, because no fighter or no organization is perfect. As Secretary said, the only people that can claim perfection are those who are complete or are totally inactive. So we want to correct all the mistakes of those who came before us and expand on their impeccable contributions. The other thing we will teach these children, Sister Tata, is not to be intimidated of their history. Mm. They can do more than Malcolm. They can do more than Cabral. They can do more than Mary McLeod Bethune. They can mm. do more than Ida B. Wells. They shouldn't be intimidated. And we should stop mortalizing our great historical figures. Our goal in this decolonization process is to make the norm the exception and the exception the norm. Our yes. history of struggle is a history of extraordinary people. Both of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey's wives, Amy Ashwood Garvey and Amy Jacques Garvey, he was married to them separately. He didn't practice polygamy for people who don't know. But they they were both, they were exceptional. The Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey was exceptional. Henrietta Vinton Davis was exceptional. But we want to make people like that the norm. Mm. And make the cowards the exception. Make the opportunists the exception. Make the traitors the exception. That's the goal, to make the exception the norm. That's what decolonization has to do for us and ultimately will do for us. We may not be privileged to witness these victories, but we're obligated to create the climate and atmosphere to ensure the victory is inevitable. That's all we want to do. So that's why we've strategically targeted the children. Let me give you um, some of the plays that we've done. Correct. Um, our very first play was called African Liberation Day Through the Eyes of Children. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we did that is because neo-colonialist Africa has extracted liberation from mm -hmm. the word and now it's Africa Day. And even countries on a revolutionary trajectory diplomatically, just to keep the peace in the African Union, let that go. But that's a fight at the grassroots level. It's going to be African Liberation Day because we are not yet liberated. And when we're finally liberated, as Zimbabwe is, we see through Zimbabwe, we see through Eritrea, we see through Namibia, we see through Mozambique. It's harder to maintain independence than it is to attain independence. So the liberation process is forever and ever and ever. It's an eternal thing. But um, so we, we, we understand that. And so all, all we are saying is that, um, and so we, we did that play. The next play we did is Cuba's greatest army. And their greatest army, in their opinion, are not the guerrillas in the July 26 movement who against all odds defeated the Batista regime, not the 300 armed rebellions that our cap that we had when we were under captivity, the greatest one led by that African warrior, Jose Aponte, who was beheaded by the Spaniards. They say their greatest army is their doctors, the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade, as they have 57 brigades in 40 nations right now fighting Corona, as they have 4,000 doctors spread throughout Africa. The people in Haiti who just experienced an earthquake the other day, they're already yelling for their Cuban doctors to attend to them. They don't mm. want the Red Cross to touch them. They don't want doctors without borders to touch them. They want the Cuban doctors. So we felt it was necessary to create that play. We did a play on Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and Thomas Sankara. We did mm. a play called um, Same Neighborhood, Different Perspectives, a conversation between Kwame Ture and Colin Powell. If you know Colin Powell and Kwame Ture's history, they grew up in the same neighborhood four years apart. Kwame Ture, um, as the chairman of SNCC, helped coin the slogan, hell no, we won't go, at a time where we were 33% of the front line in Vietnam, but we were only 18% of the um, population. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was the first organization in this country to come out against the Vietnam War. 
Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown en route to Vietnam to present a plan to end the war, architected by Lyndon Johnson. So we stood with the Vietnamese people, but as a result of it, we smashed the draft in this country. Colin Powell enjoyed Vietnam so much, he volunteered for a second tour. He enjoyed slaughtering Vietnamese people. He covered up the Malay massacre. The same way he covered up the CIA selling drugs in Los Angeles. Kwame Ture loved Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel Movement in Grenada. Colin Powell invaded Grenada and gave Reagan a gun as a souvenir. So even if you live in the same neighborhood, you can have a different ideological outlook. So it comes down to exposure. Never downplay exposure. We did another play called Sally Mugabe Lives Forever, because if you know Zimbabwe's history, the conference that she had in the 1980s dealing with children with leprosy, dealing with um, children whose mothers were prostitutes, children with HIV AIDS, that set the course for 10 years later. Every June 16th, we celebrate the Day of the African Child. So all our plays have this type of thrust. All of our plays have this type of concentration. All of our plays have this focus. We did one called Samora and Araminta, treating the sick, liberating the oppressed. Araminta Ross is the birth name of Harriet Tubman. She was a nurse. Samora Marshall of Mozambique was a nurse. His middle name is Moises. It's just how you say Moses in Portuguese. Her, we called her Moses. So women can be liberators and men can be nurses. And as a matter of fact, if you know the history of the revolution in Mozambique, they had to escape Mozambique physically to go to Tanzania for military and guerrilla training. Mm -hmm. They patterned their escape route after studying the Underground Railroad in the United States. Mm -hmm. So what we're saying is these are the type of plays we do. We just did a play last year, well, at the end of 2020, called The Key Swahili Explosion. And it was a play um, done in key Swahili with English subtitles. And it turned attention to the fact that there are 14 million homeless children in East Africa. So they mm. made an appeal to Africans who celebrate Kwanzaa in the United States, who, who, who know the Swahili language. We're 43% of the homeless in North America, even though we're 12% of the population. So we made the Pan-African linkage connection dealing with the homelessness question. So mm. these are the type of plays we do. We, we're doing a play this African Liberation Day about Akme Sekouture and Mbalia Kamara. For your listeners who don't know, Mbalia Kamara was the leader of the women in the Democratic Party of Guinea in their quest to liberate Guinea from French colonialism. And she was stabbed by the traditional African chiefs that were working with the French in the stomach while she was pregnant. She did not survive, but her child survived. And she has the largest statue in Guinea. So the name of the play is Ready for the Revolution. Because many people mm. don't give Sekwetere and Guinea credit for what they did for the Pan-African struggle. Making mm. Nkrumah his co-president was not a popular thing to do. Arming your entire nation was not a popular thing to do. It's the first nation in Africa to use the arts as the cornerstone of their revolution. That's why they're the first country to tell their story to the world in Africa in the form of a ballet something that Russia is celebrated for and China is celebrated for and Cuba is celebrated for. And even though the neo-colonialist government of Lasana Conte did everything to wipe away the contributions of the Democratic Party of Guinea, the revolutionary ballet in Guinea has survived after all these years. And we mm -hmm. want to give condolences to Sekou Toure's family. His daughter just passed away not too long ago. So we mm -hmm. wanted to, um, for those watching this who will see this in Guinea, um, we want to give our um, condolences and long live, the, like we said, Sekutere turns 100 this year. So we're going to do that play with children. We did a play last year called Y'all Understand What I'm Saying about Paul Robeson. And it starts with Jackie Robinson because he attacked Paul Robeson before the House of Un-American Activities Committee, saying when Paul Robeson said that our people wouldn't fight against the Soviet Union, he was speaking for himself. And then what happened was Paul Robeson in the play he expresses his displeasure with Jackie Robinson attacking him to gain favor with our enemies. And then we have children recite one of our poems in Igbo, in Mugamo, a Cameroonian language, in Kiswahili and Shona and Spanish, because Paul Robeson was because Paul Robeson was a because Paul Robeson was a multilinguist, as many people watching this may know. So these are the type of plays that we do. And our goal 
is to start branches of the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company everywhere. But we also get the children to do um, things with skills they may have. So mm. we had a 10 and 13 year old, two brothers and sisters, two and a half years ago, they're DJs. And they did a virtual mixtape, a visual mixtape in honor of Kwame Ture. We had another child do a video bringing attention to Cuba and Venezuela's efforts to eradicate blindness when he was 19 years old in the Americas. They have a project called Project Miracle. And then we had a group of children a few years ago who wanted to take on Hollywood. And they said that one of the best things we can do to deal with the question of police terrorism and U.S. military repression and violence globally is if our actors and actresses would not play police officers in films and television, would not play military officers on film and television, would not play intelligence agents. Because one of the things that we have to realize is that whenever the police slaughter our children in the streets of the United States, what they do is they use that effort to recruit our people into their ranks. As a matter of fact, right now, I don't know if it's like this in the rest of the diaspora, and this might be going on in Africa, but in the United States, one of the main things that is dominant is STEM. Children talking about science and mathematics. And initially, we don't have a problem with that because mm. we want more, we want more Benjamin Bannockers. We want more Ernest Everett Just. We want more scientists. We want more doctors. Mm. But... If they're gonna be working for the CIA, if they're gonna be working for the FBI, if they're gonna be working for the Navy, the Army, the Air Force and the Marines, and they're gonna benefit from their scientific prowess, they're gonna benefit from their mathematical aptitude and not we the hungry, we the exploited, we the dehumanized, then we have a fundamental problem with that. Mm -hmm. But the key is to offer alternatives. So what we're saying is this mass emphasis process through um, training them to utilize their skills to advance our resistance, treating, teaching them not to be intimidated of their history. Mm -hmm. This is what we're saying. Somebody said we should start wearing our African clothes. I don't think you saw my shirt. But, and I, of course, you do it all the time. So, of course. And Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, he made it mandatory that the ministers in town wore a tunic which was their traditional dress. So they mm. didn't come to their office with shirts and ties on, of course. But at the same time, when we wear those African clothes, when we speak these African languages, it is to advance the revolutionary process because you can spread neocolonialism in Igbo, no good. You can spread neocolonialism in Shona, no good. You can express neo, um, put, promote neocolonialism in Swahili, in Amirik, in Tigrean, in the 5,000 indigenous languages. We don't want that. We don't want you promoting neocolonialism in an indigenous language. We don't want you promoting it in a colonial language. Whatever mm -hmm. language we speak, what must transcend the dialect is messages of resistance, activity rooted in resistance, making the fighting spirit what drives us wherever we are in the world. That's all we want to do. And that's what history obligates us to do. And we want to do this for the children coming up. This hmm. is all we want to do. And um, this Saturday, we're having that class. We will send you the particulars so that you can promote it. So if people through technology can get on, whether you're in Africa, whether you're in the Caribbean, then hmm. do it. If you want to start a branch of our theater company anywhere in Africa, anywhere in the Caribbean, do it. If you already have youth ensembles that do this type of thing, we would love to partner with you like we said before. This mm -hmm. is what we want to do because the reality is this is how we have to move. And it's very important when we bring attention to these efforts because when we have these assemblings and we have these gatherings and these speakers get before you and pontificate, it almost assumes that work is not going on. Correct. And all that exposes is even though they're the ones in front of you, they're disconnected with the work that's going on around them. Mm. They're definitely not involved in it because if they were, why would they say we need to? Or they are uncomfortable. And then the other thing is capitalism breeds contempt. It breeds competition and what have you. So there are people who are familiar with our efforts, Sister Tata, but they'll act like they're not going on because it's profitable to promote the defeatist narrative the narrative of victimization oh nothing's being done 
And I say that to say we can never do enough. We're never satisfied with what we do. We never, mm. we're never satisfied with what we do because we can always do more. So we're always looking and see that's in the spirit of saying that we're not intimidated. I feel I'm supposed to do more than Malcolm, King, Sankara, Biko. You know why? Because I'm old. I lived longer than them. I'm 52. All of them were taken from us in their 30s. So I'm supposed mm. to do more just based on that. I'm supposed to do more. And I'm not saying that I want to be on T-shirts like them. I want streets named after me, schools named after me, children named after me. I'm not concerned oh, with yes. the record. I'm not concerned with the recognition. I'm concerned with the quality of the contribution that we make. And when I we see. say that, we don't mean that singular. We mean it plurally. We want to mm. make contribution after contribution after contribution after contribution where we've made so many contributions that you forget about your contributions and it is the masses of the people that remind you about what Correct. you've done. And yeah. I have to say, humbly, I'm finally getting to that point. I walk the streets of DC and people are telling me about a demonstration 20 years ago, about a project 15 years ago, about a play 11 years ago. And it's not in our psyche at that exact moment, but it's always good to reflect on it to ignite the spirit, to continue to serve the people more loyally, more faithfully, and more selflessly. And that's the other thing these children will learn. Dr. King said, life's most urgent and persistent question is what are you doing for others? Mm. But our children are taught to give back. And what that means is you seek to pursue your own individual goals. And then after you've pursued them, when you're in the mood, when you feel like it, then you do something for your people where our culture of resistance re def rejects that notion. We say give first, give foremost, give always. Correct. Absolutely. Give to, the, give to the struggle when you don't have a job. Give to the struggle when you have three or four jobs. Give to the struggle whether you have a PhD, like Dr. Carter G. Woodson or Du Bois. Give to the struggle if you only went to the eighth grade like Malcolm or the fifth grade like the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, or got thrown out of school 14 years old like Ahmed Sekouture for organizing a food strike. Your academic pedigree doesn't matter. Give to this struggle whether you're a Christian or a Muslim, or you practice the Andinkra, or you practice Juju, or you practice any of the traditional spiritual disciplines. Give to this struggle. Give to this struggle whether you're a woman. Give to this struggle whether you're a man. Give to the struggle whether you're a teacher or an architect or an engineer or a taxi driver or a cook. Give to the struggle whether you're a farmer. It doesn't matter. Contributions must come from everybody. Give to the struggle whether you're the child of a great freedom fighter. Give to the struggle whether you're the child of a prostitute or a drug addict or a thief or a rapist or a pedophile. Still give to the struggle. It doesn't matter. We take contributions from children, regardless of your family background, regardless of where you were born. If you're African and you know that you must know that Africa's future depends on you, whether you're in the diaspora. Look at the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. No one did more to get us to embrace Africa than him, but he never touched foot on the African continent one day. Mm. One day. But he did more than most people who are going to spend their whole life in an African nation. So th that doesn't have to be the reason. But don't get me. But that's not for me to say we want Africans to come home the same way Muslims go to Mecca and Christians go to Ethiopia or Bethlehem. So come home. But when you come, look at how you can contribute. Look at how you can empower. Look at how you can be part of the resistance. Don't when you go to when you come home out of the diaspora, if you settle in Africa, you those of you who are going to Ghana, like gamblers go to Atlantic City and Las Vegas in the United States, your only conversation with the Ghanaians shouldn't be to cook your food or clean your toilets or water your plants. Your main conversation should be how to reignite the legacy of Nkrumah. But if you're not part of that path, then you need to get on that path. You should not be there to promote neocolonialism. 
You should not be there to advance um, Western interest in Africa. No, 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 no. And this is something that um, we have to, um, and this is why um, our activity is geared right now at um, our younger people, because very soon when they get in college age, when they go to these colleges in the United States, um, Sister uh, Tata, this is how they separate us. Like at the historical black colleges and universities, this is what they do. The students born on the continent join the African Student Union. The students born in the Caribbean join the Caribbean Student Union. The students born in the United States, they are part of the student government. And in most cases, they don't organize together. In most cases, they don't work together. But the school will tell them that that's celebrating diversity. If they go to a predominantly white institution like Harvard or Princeton or Yale, then they have an Arab student union, which promote which propagates the notion that North Africa is really not part of Africa. Then you have the African student union and the Caribbean student union and the Black student union. The Black Student Union are the students born in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Washington, New York, Mississippi. The Caribbean are the students born in Haiti, Jamaica, Guyana, Antigua, so on and so on, and the African Student Union. And so under diversity, they're separated. So they don't learn the history of, the, of all these places. But Pan-Africanism, one of the main staples of it is Trinidad, right? Henry mm -hmm. Sylvester Williams is credited with being the first person to use the term. And he also is the first African to practice law in what's called South Africa. So no, 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 no. What we, so we're, we're looking to navigate around this and, and do, but through work, through labor, through service. And this is why um, when we have this platform, we wanted to spend most of our time telling you about the work we're doing, the ideas we're, because when you execute an idea, you make the idea more appealing. Mm -hmm. If you just articulate the idea, people who can't articulate the idea with the eloquence that you do may not feel comfortable with the idea, even I if it should. resonates with them. So we have to be careful that anytime we have platforms like this, mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, this is my challenge to interviewers everywhere. When you ask someone to touch on an issue that might be in the news as of late, don't just ask them to touch on the issue. Ask them what work have they done around that issue. Correct. Ask us what we've done around Burkina Faso. As yes. a matter of fact, we had the honor of putting on our children's play about Thomas Sankara in front of Thomas Sankara's two brothers that live in Washington, D.C. Hmm. And they were shocked. You hear me? So hmm. that was the ultimate honor. We put on, um, so, so this is what I'm saying. When we talk about Eritrea, we've been working with the EPLF since we were students in 1991. The only adult play I've ever written and will ever write is called Gorillas, Mothers and Wives. It's about the Eritrean women because Eritrea has the highest level of women's participation in the guerrilla war in the history of the world, not just Africa. 33% of the guerrillas in Eritrea were women, were women. So you can't you can't you can't say you embrace the queens that resisted foreign invaders and not embrace these women that in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s were on the battlefield for their beloved nation. Mm. No, 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 no. So this is what we're saying. So these are the type of plays we do. And this is the type of this is the narrative we're trying to attract our young people to. And we're willing to bridge these gaps at the moment right now and then. This African student unions in the United States, I don't know if it's like that in the rest of the diaspora, they're set up to deal with cultural expression on the surface. So you join them and they just talk to you about our clothing and our food. But if you know the history of the African student union, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah started that when he was at Lincoln University going to Penn. But they said the African student union cannot be a political organizing weapon. For the same reason that the Obama administration started the Young African Leadership Institute to promote neo to start neo-colonialist training in the United States. So you get no more in Krumas, people who leave Africa for formal education and come back revolutionary. Or like Emil Cabral, who went to Portugal to study agricultural science, coming back a revolutionary. 
or like Maurice Bishop going to London to study law at Gray's End and to come back to lead the New Jew movement and the most important revolution in the Caribbean since the Haitian Revolution in 1804 and the Cuban Revolution in 1959. So the African Student Union is very central to that brain drain process, but that's why we want to start with them very young. We have to teach them starting at five, at six and seven about what we're talking about now. And don't say it can't be done because not only are we doing it, but tell yourself this. Do you think that it's by accident that toy companies make soldiers for children at the age of five and six? And those children mm. grow up and they join these European militaries and join these intelligence agencies. So if they start promoting their values very young, why would we believe, why would we think we have the luxury to wait till our children, quote unquote, come of age? And I'm not talking about imposing anything. What we have learned through our illustrious history, you can't impose the truth or a lie. Correct. There's a dip, the, 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 if there's a thinner line than the line between love and hate, or um, is the um, line between imposition and exposure. We don't want to impose anything on the African child, but we want to expose the African child to everything because we have no fear. We have no fear. As long as they understand the difference between being knowledgeable about our struggle and being active in our struggle. Mm. That's all we want and give them a chance to make an informed choice. They might not choose to, but and then there's a third dimension. They can be a support system for our struggle. Mm. Because we do need support. Our fighters need support. Our organizations need support. In the United States, our main organizations are financed by our enemies. This is why, this is why um, if you're a, a leader of a civil rights organization, you're not just the president of it, you're a CEO of it, which means they have a corporate account. How many, pro I remember President Mugabe at the SADC summit in 2014. He said that SADC has to finance its own activities. Hmm. So we don't even find it. So in all these conferences you hear people have about economics, how come no one talks about financing our resistance? George Soros can't finance you and you say that you're progressive or on a revolutionary track. Robin Renwick can't finance you. You shouldn't even be around Robin Renwick. You shouldn't even be talking to Robin Renwick if you say that you're a soldier, if you're a soldier in this African liberation struggle. What are we doing seeking financing from these entities? No, we have to finance ourselves. Everything that we do, but finance the resistance. These people who are talking about um, economic development in businesses. This is why we're saying, are you going to find, are you willing to give money to uh, towards uh, Cuban medical supplies so they can do their work in Africa. Those African nations don't have the budgets for it. We're supposed to finance that. No Cuban doctor in Africa should be without the necessary medical supplies to do their work because not only are they treating our sick, but they're training the young people who are gonna stay in their countries and not come to Washington, not come to New York, not come to Paris, not come to Germany for a more comfortable affluent lifestyle. They're gonna stay with their people and deal with the hardships. Those are the type of things we should economically support. So if a matter of fact, since this is Sacred to Ray's birthday, I'm a folk, that's why I've been focused on it. He said it is not the adaptation of political action to economic action. On the contrary, it is the use of economic activities for political ends. Our economic activities must be for our resistance. Not to figure out who's going to be the next Jay-Z, mm -hmm. the next Beyonce. No, that's not. That's but but if we're trying to be comfortably exploited, then that's the path you've chosen. But if you're talking about dealing with liberation and being ready to embrace the hardships that come with the territory, then you're on a whole nother side of the spectrum, whole nother side of the spectrum. And this is what resonates with our people. The reason that Thomas Sankara is beloved like he is, when he died, he had a bicycle, a motorcycle, a refrigerator that didn't work, and two guitars. He, he lived it. So people never questioned him. He wouldn't let the ministers travel first class anymore. 
he took their Mercedes Benzes from them. He said, we have to reject the opulence. No need for opulence. Not if we're talking about being liberated. And it's difficult. It's not easy. When Charles de Gaulle, his response to Secretary and the Democratic Party of Guinea refusing his referendum, what did he do? He took the toilet paper and said, wipe your free behind. He took the, he took the telephone lines. He took his teachers, his bankers, his engineers. He took everything and said, if you truly want to be independent, start anew. And they accepted the challenge. We can't be comfortable. I remember um, sitting with my colleagues at the United Nations in Zimbabwe. Um, I'm part of the press team in my capacity as the U.S. correspondent to the Herald. So I'm there and they were talking about um, fuel difficulties. And I told them, I said, for the most part, Harare's flat land, put down the cars, ride bicycles. Nobody will have gout. Nobody will have diabetes. What about our children? They can't ride bikes. Teach them how to ride bikes. And let's just ride bikes all through Harare. And everybody will see that example. That's not idealistic. That is practical. But we have to be prepared to pay the price to talk about what we're talking about. We have to show people we're willing to take the price, pay this price. And when they see we're ready to pay this price, they'll think twice about trying to interfere with us. They're challenging us to, to show this level of commitment. They're right. challenging us. I, talk, I talked to a church, a church, a, lady, a freedom fight out of the church before I got on here. And she said that, um, and she's in the rural part of New York, teaching people how to farm, using um, and working with people to deal with homeopathic remedies. And she said that because she went to Cuba with a group of churches, she hasn't been able to get grants. And I told her, no, 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 no. Yes, exactly. Of course, that comes with the territory. So they try to intimidate us. When our young people protest, they call the leaders of the protest in and say, we'll put you through law school if you stop this. We'll put you through medical school if you stop this. They are, so conv they are convinced that bribery is more effective than assassinations ever were. And their presumption is that we can be bored. We can't wait to sell ourselves. We can't wait to mortgage our history, mortgage our culture. This is what they assume. Mm. But you know what? The element of surprise hasn't failed us all this time. So we say, fine, assume that about us. Assume you have us under control. Assume your saboteurs are effective. Assume your masqueraders are confusing everybody. But when the smoke clears, you'll realize that you you'll realize that you um, were responsible for your own demise. And it's not our job to tip you, tip you off. You go on like everything is normal. And we're talking, you know, and so the enemy, they, we know them and they know us. There are no, there are no more secrets. Everything is out in the open. There's no more overt intelligence. There's every, I mean, there's no more covert intelligence. Everything is out in the open. The United States Agency for International Development does what the CIA used to do behind in the dark. It's out in the open. It's no secret. You can go to a link called www.thomas.gov and see everything that the U.S. Congress and Senate is doing and their plans for Africa. They don't hide it. Their plans for the Caribbean, they don't hide it, which means they're daring us to stop it. They're daring us to resist. They're daring us to overcome it. What are we going to do? They're telling you that they don't care about democracy. If 154 nations are saying the Cuban blockade must be lifted and only the U.S. and Israel maintain that it must exist, they're daring you to force them to overturn it. If the whole African Union has said the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act must be lifted and it still exists, they're daring you to overturn it. I remember talking to uh, former South African president, Thabo Mbeki, the African Union in passing. He recognized me from Zimbabwe and he said, hey, we've done our part. Now it's up to you all to put the pressure on the United States to lift sanctions on Zimbabwe. I said, we mm -hmm. accept the challenge. We accept the challenge. Mm -hmm. But don't assume we haven't done anything, though. Just know we must can stay in contact with each other and compare notes on what things we must do to intensify our most genuine efforts. Mm.
And through and, and somehow, some way, the most disciplined workers, the most dedicated workers, the most dedicated organizations, we'll meet each other, we'll come in contact with each other, and we'll make the most of when we come in contact with each other. Mm. It's not about photo ops. It's not about praising each other on podiums. It's about the work we do behind the scenes. It's about right. the daily constant service. So mm. we're up to it. So this is why we're saying we're very optimistic about what this mass emphasis process can do through the theater company, through the Positive Action and Creativity Youth Brigade, and through this History, Education, and Navigational Institute, teaching African history using resistance for the purpose of making resistance the cornerstone of the narrative, transforming the island of Black excellence into a training ground for African resistance, taking advantage of your skills, your talents, your ingenuity, and your, and your inherent love for yourselves, your inherent love for us, because they go together, um, to crush the culture of individualism. Because even in imperialist North America, they're hypocrites. The worst form of incarceration is solitary confinement. When they put you in a cell by yourself, people go insane, people commit suicide. When you're declared a drug addict, if you have a cocaine problem, if you have a heroin problem, if you have a morphine problem, if you have a PCP problem, they put you in group therapy with other drug addicts, other alcoholics to listen to each other, to help each other overcome. So individuals cannot evolve and develop in a vacuum, in isolation. So even they, the nation who imposes a culture globally to promote individualism over the collective, even they know when a human being is at their best, it's through focusing on the collective. Mm -hmm. They know it. So what are we doing acting like, or what are we doing focusing on brands instead of movement? We cannot use the strategies and tactics of the enemy against the enemy. We have to have, we have to, we depend on our ingenuity. So we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't fear this enemy of ours. We never have. And we're not going to start now, but we're going to make a concerted effort for the hearts and minds of our children. We've been doing it for a very long time. I've been teaching African history to children for 31 years, but these, oh. but these particular vehicles, you know, this is this has been a more later thing because we realize that um what we have to do is um we have to come up with these practical outlets so that the children can recognize um that they have a role to play in this effort and many people ask the question well how do they maintain this information all i say to people like that is do it and see when we had um a few years ago we had two of uh, some of the best students we've ever had had a brilliant 11 year old named Omoa Salam and another one named Zion Yutsi. Um, they were 14 and 11 at the time. And they went to an advanced African diaspora studies class at Howard University. And they got up in front of the class and they taught them the African nations using that formula that I went through earlier. Mm -hmm. And they called me and they could not understand how college students could not name more than 10 African nations. And I told them lack of exposure. That's why we feel obligated to share it with you so that you can go and share it with them. And, and how good did that make you feel? And they felt so empowered and they were humble. They didn't talk down to those college students for not knowing what they learned. They accepted that they hadn't learned it and felt obligated to share it with them. Once again, teaching them to seek our history, digest our history and to share our history, but to share it humbly, to share it selflessly, to share it lovingly. We cannot condemn each other for not knowing what we're just learning ourselves. Absolute. So this is so these are the lessons that we want to teach these children. And um, to get more information, um, the Instagram um, is at mass emphasis 2012, at mass emphasis 2012, and the Twitter is at mass emphasis. If you want to communicate with me about these things, um, my email address, you see my name on the screen, it's O-B-I-E-G-B-U-N-A-1-5 at gmail.com. And, mm -hmm. um, 
And that's why, um, and so this is the reason why um, we feel um, comfortable, motivated. And our goal is, you know, we feel we're continuing the legacy of Dr. Carter G. Woodson with this work, the legacy of um, Walim Mujilis Nirere with this work, the legacy of Robert Mugabe with this work. Or, um, and the reason is because they were teachers. The, the, the work of Benjamin Mays or the work of Mary McLeod Bethune or the work of Louis, Lucy Craft Laney or the, the work of um, these great Clara Muhammad, um, all these great educators who, who understood the role of education and the decolonization process. But at the same time, one of the other things we've seen in Africa and the Caribbean and Latin America is when we've made political progress, we've given our people the best formal education but not ideological training that goes with the formal education. Absolutely. And they end up and they end up being agents. Um, I was so imp when I first met, when I when I had the honor of sitting down for a one hour meeting with late president and Pan-African icon Robert Gabriel Mugabe in New York. Um, he told me, he said, Yeah, everybody marvels at the fact that Zimbabwe has a 97% literacy rate. He said, but we must admit, we gave our children the best formal education but not political education. And that's why many of them are opposition today. Mm. So we must make sure when we give them the best science, the best math, the best um, a formal education, they must have the political education. That's what we've stepped up to the plate to attempt to tackle. And we can't do it without you. So like we're saying, if you're listening to this, um, we're humble by your compliments. We're humble by your encouragement but we would be more enthusiastic if we get correspondence from you saying that you want to be part of this effort. Um, uh, Obi, can, can you just talk again about uh, the uh, the classes starting on Saturday? If people yes, want to um, they, um, how do they if they want to, if, if they want to participate, um, they can get, they can email us. Um, my email, my personal one is O-B-I-E-G-B-U-N-A-15 at gmail.com. That's mm -hmm. my personal one. The um, Instagram is at mass emphasis 2012. Yes. And the um, Twitter is at mass emphasis. emphasis. And we'll be able to get your children um, registration forms. We're focusing on children 9 to 13 and 14 through 18 youth. Um, mm. The, the, the 9 to 13 class starts East Coast United States time from uh, 3 to 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. and um, from 4 to 5 p.m. And we also have a class that um, one of our uh, young um, Cameroonian comrades, um, Prudence Itika, um, set up, Ichika, um, set up for us in Alberta, Canada. So we'll be dealing with some young people there. So um, that how can, so how, we, how can we all right? It, how did they set it? Is it a virtual? It's Is virtual. It it's virtual. It's virtual. We will right. we will have the we will have the link up on Facebook tonight and on Instagram okay. and Twitter tonight. So for people that want to register, but once we knew that we were coming on here, we uh, were so excited that we had a chance to promote this on a global level. There's a lot of enthusiasm in the United States, but we have a Pan African focus. So. Um, We've worked it out with some of our comrades in Haiti that they're going to take the recordings and show them to students there and translate what we're saying. So the, this is the way we're going to approach it. And this is available for our young people all over the world. And we know that the advent of technology is to our advantage. And so we plan to maximize our potential with what we're doing. So it is virtual and you will be able to see it and you'll be. A and we just wanted to give you an overview of the approach that we take to teaching, what our motivation is, who our influences are. Because like I said, this is a um, collective movement process. So we wanted to talk about some of the people who've inspired us to do this. So we are here because of what happened in Soweto. We are here because of Brown versus Board of Education. We are here because of um, Burkina Faso under Thomas Sankara, Zimbabwe's commitment to education, Eritrea's commitment to education. But the formal education is a given for the most part. Our people know how fundamental that is. But we take um, historical exposure, political education for granted. 
And that is the cycle that this is set up to break. Mm -hmm. Is it possible um, that we get, I mean, because you already have, for instance, like the poem and how to learn, you know, the, yeah. the countries. And you stuff. can have everything. Sure. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, uh, we can look at ways that um, we can record some of the recordings of the classes can be shown on here. If that can be facilitated. Definitely. We're open to all those possibilities. So that people see how we're doing this, they see how we're approaching this. And, you know, there's nothing like being seen in action. No, no lawyer objects to you watching them in the courtroom. No surgeon objects to you operating, um, you seeing them operate after the fact. So we're as comfortable in a classroom as um, a doctor is on the surge operation table or a lawyer is in court. Um, or a mortician is when they're dealing with a body that's decomposed or what have you. We're comfortable. Mm -hmm. This is our skill. And like we said, um, we reached a conclusion in our 30s that we had to re go back to that methodology, organizing our people through utilizing skills, not just our drive and conviction um, to ideas. But mm -hmm. how do I as a teacher push the ideas I've given my life to? How do I as a doctor, how do I as an engineer, how do I as a cook, how do I as a nurse, how do I as an actress or an actor or a writer, how are my skills used to re to have resistance, so Absolutely. to en enhance resistance? So this is what it's about. So they'll see a practical example of someone who has who is harnessing. And for the record, um, many of the people that you've interviewed, and you may even refer to them this way. And I humbly ask people to never refer to me this way. There's a term in North America that we have in our resistance circles where somebody's considered a master teacher. You've heard it, right? I'll never be a master teacher. I'll, I hope no one ever refers to me as a master teacher because every class I'm looking to get better. Every what about interaction veteran? I'm looking to better. What about I'm better? A, well, it says that on the flyer that we have, but I'm a gorilla. I'm in, we're into gorilla teaching because when you get into public schools in the southern part of the United States, that requires some maneuvering. When you get into public schools in Washington, D.C., that um, requires maneuvering. When you when you're able to work with homes, set up a homeschool network like the Sankofa Homeschool Community, who we have the honor we've been teaching there for the longest time. The Nation of Islam is criticized by its detractors saying that they reject Africa. I have taught Muhammad University of Islam students for the last 12 years. So that is not true. And they do not interfere. They sit back and they allow us to teach African history with a revolutionary thrust to their mm -hmm. children. Thanks to Sister Stephanie Muhammad and Minister Kadir Muhammad. And we're in talks with them about teaching all of the Muhammad University campuses all over the country who were under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So, and also, let me say this um, we know that many of our organizations right now don't have programs to teach kids history. So, of the Universal Negro Improvement Association African Communities League, and we thank our sister, Dr. Chinzira for promoting this in the Virgin Islands and promoting this in the Caribbean. So if you've got children in the UNIA and you're busy and you feel you could spend more time with your children, give them to us. All African People's Revolutionary Party, give it to your children if you don't have time for them for an hour every Saturday. NAACP children, give your children to us. ZANU-PF, Free Limo, MPLA, EPLF, if you feel that we truly serve you, Give your children to us just for an hour. And everywhere we've been in the revolutionary process, we've set up similar things. They had the Nkrumah Ideological Institute in Ghana. They have a Chitepo Ideological Institute in Zimbabwe. This is very important to the children. Some of us take our children through different rites of passages, but we don't give them the political education and the historical right. foundation. Come mm. to us. This service is for you, too. So we're asking for individual children, but we're also appealing to our organized formations. If you don't have a program in place, because this history, um, this African historical cultural reclamation movement, there are three things imperialism fears from the African. Strikes, demonstrations, boycotts, rebellions with an anti-imperialist leaning 
And this African cultural historical reclamation movement where we use the culture and history to make resistance the cornerstone of our narrative. They have fears our films are gonna take on that character. Black excellence, black excellence that's, their, that's their effort to try to dilute this process, to redirect this process, but it's not gonna work because if people can digest black excellence, African resistance is right around the corner for them and they're gonna love it even more. So what we, and so we, and we just do different things. Like for example, we don't even believe in jumping right to Africa when we're dealing with the diaspora. Like if I'm talking to a group of North American students, I'm gonna take the people who they know, the few they know, whose work in Africa who, or whose connection to Africa has been downplayed. So most students we talk to have seen Thurgood Marshall's image before have maybe watched one of his films with their parents. So they know he was, um, he argued the Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954 that was responsible for desegregating the public schools. They know he's the first African to be a Supreme Court justice, Sister Tata, but they don't mm -hmm. know that he wrote Kenya's constitution, helped write it. And mm -hmm. he put a provision in there that we had to buy our land back from the British to not snatch it back. You mm -hmm. couldn't go to them and say, get out my grandmother's house. But the fact that you talk about that, they won't know that Dr. King went to Ghana. They'll know about him in Montgomery, him in Selma, him in Birmingham, him in Mississippi, him in Chicago, but not why he went to Ghana. They won't even know that Maya Angelou lived in Ghana mm -hmm. and was part of a repatriate community. So mm -hmm. we can take the people who they know about, whose connection to Africa is always downplayed, Mm. before we begin to touch on the continent itself. Truly being Pan-African, like we said, we don't teach Africa at the expense of sweeping the diaspora under the rug. Correct. But we do make, but people will know that give their children to us, that they will realize that we all don't have Australia in common. We all don't have North America in common. We all don't have Brazil in common. We all don't have India in common. We all don't have Pakistan in common, but the one place we have in common is our mother. So all we're saying is be a good daughter and good son to your mother and not mm. the mother that gave you birth, but the continent that we all call mother. I and one, and the first simple poem, the very first day, the first one they learn is one because we um, imperialism doesn't like us to understand the concept of the extended family because the extended family goes beyond your relatives and your bloodline. So we tell right. the children the first day, your whole family isn't coming to your graduation. They're not coming to your um, your, wet, your wedding. They're not coming to celebrate the, your birthday, but they're still your sisters and brothers. So the poem we do there is called, We All Love Our Mother. I have a lot of sisters, I have a lot of brothers, I have a lot of cousins, I have a lot of uncles, I have a lot of aunties, but we all have the same mother. She's my mother's mother. She's my father's mother. She's my great grandparents mother. She's my ancestors mother. The mother that we're talking about is mother Africa. The mother that we're talking about is mother Africa. We must defend our mother by standing for our mother, standing up for our mother. We must come together in the name of our mother. We all love our mother. We all love our mother. We all love our mother. So that's the very, first, we teach that to five year olds and six year olds right now. So they we understand. We teach ourselves. I'm sorry, Obi, you, I'm, I'm, I'm like, no. Um, there has to be adult classes. They have to be now. I mean, no, 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 no. Let me let me just say this about that real quickly. The yes. method is to teach through the children, so mm. the adult will get nine times out of ten because it's virtual. Many so the parents are right there, the grandparents are right there, and if I could, I'll send you some of the testimonies from some of the parents who asked us to help promote this because they were so grateful for what we've done for their children. Sure. So when you hear the grandparents and the mothers and the fathers talk about how they feel about this, and this is, and this is the key to so many things. Right now in the United States, tears come to our eyes when we hear about what goes on in Chicago or Detroit and Baltimore where our children are killing each other. But in all the years that we've had violence prevention programs, whether it's the great program that Jim Brown, the Hall of Fame football player, had in Los Angeles that played a very important role in stopping the Bloods and Crips from killing each other in Los Angeles. 
There was never a part of that program that dealt with teaching our history. The efforts in Chicago, that is absent. Um, the only program that I know that ever infused that was in Washington, D.C., a great overlooked brother named Al Malik Farrakhan in Ceasefire, Don't Smoke the Brothers and Sisters. And I was his advisor for a couple of years. And we sat down and we said, you know, we must be that model where we deal with violence prevention, but we have to have a program where we teach the history to the young people so Absolutely. they can change the way they look at each other. How yes. come that's not part of it? We have all these Bible studies at churches all over the world. How many Bible studies focus on our history? So this is so these are the things that so for us, it's not about being critical of people for not having these things in 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 existence, but letting them know that we exist for that purpose and we are offering this service to everybody, like we said. So this is all we're trying to do. This is all we're trying to do, sister. And we thank you for giving us the platform to promote this. So yes, oh we will God. have so I'm, so I'm we so so, so we so the target, so the target is the child, but we're like that double barrel shotgun. You know, when you shoot a shotgun, it spreads wide. So while the child is the focus, the parent will learn everything that we're talking about. The grandparent will learn everything that we're talking about. But we're using the child for strategic purposes because if people trust you to educate their child, then they trust you to um, have everything. They, they'll be very accepting and embracing objectively of the information. And I want to, um, because I know we're coming up on time. I'm quite sure we've been up here for a minute, and you know. But I'll say this much: a lot of people have spent the last couple of years criticizing different individuals that they feel are fraudulent in the name of Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. And many of you will use your platforms to bring those people on to embarrass them and humiliate them. Why don't you consider using your platform to promote programs that you know are working? Yes. That you know are necessary, that you know exist. If you aren't doing that, then all you're doing is helping with the superficiality and sensationalism that we're trying to get away from. Mm. So instead of giving that platform to this individual that you consider a masquerader or you consider a fraud, when you find out about what we're doing with mass emphasis, we hope you consider us worthy of your time. Not to promote uh, us as individuals, but to promote this outlet for our children. And How I know a lot of people are going to hear that. So um, sure, that's sure. why I felt we, compelled to say it. We we will repeat it and repeat it and rebroadcast and rebroadcast just the way we do it on the Pan-African Daily. You would yeah, hear you've, and, you, and you've made you You've it, helped increase my visibility, that's for sure, because I walk the streets of D.C. and people are saying, oh, I saw you on Pan-African Daily TV. So your <laughs> audience is definitely, and, and people email me and people call me and, and what have you. So your audience is definitely growing in the United States. We're just humbled that you extend this platform to us. And like we said, we were also humble that you'd like us to be on more. But like we said, we want to challenge an existing cycle of casual commentary. So the yes. only time you will see us is when we've got something programmatic to offer. Mm. Nothing yes. personal, but that's just the way we were trained. Oh no! Our, um, you, you, our opinions, our opinions are no better than anyone else's. The only thing we should consume you with, uh, the only time we should seek to consume you and engage you is when we have a service for you. Correct. Uh, um, what is the email again? I know it's your no. double name and what because O B O B O B I E G B U N A one five fifteen at gmail dot com. Obiagbuna15 at gmail.com. At Mass Emphasis is the Twitter. At Mass Emphasis2012 is the Instagram. And you can go to the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company Facebook page if you mm. want to leave some information up there. And we it may take us a second to get to you, but we end up responding to all correspondence. Don't mm -hmm. be offended if it takes us a few days, but we will eventually, because um, we were trained to have good communication. 
Kwame Ture told us a long time ago, you have no idea how many things are not done in the best interest of the people, not because of ideological differences, but because of sloppy communication. So we're always looking to improve our communication. No doubt about that. And we want to thank Sister Nyasha for being patient with us to get us on here. And she would reach out to us and sometimes we didn't reach back right away, but we would just, last night she even said, I'm starting to think it's not meant for you to come back on here. I said, no, we'll be back. And here we are. So we want to thank her for her efforts. Part of the struggle is to respect the labor of the laborers. So Pan-African Daily TV is what it is because of the laborers behind the scenes, not just the brilliance of Dr. Tata. Thank you. Thank you for saying that again. And, and the family is right here with you. It is all. It is the viewers. It is those that are controlling the chat. It is those that are donating. It's those that most often are listening and paying attention. It right. is those that the message is transforming. And we get a couple of this feedback all the time. We've rebroadcasted your past shows, I think, three, uh, two, three times. And the comments are always the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have learned. We have thought. So even just talking about this session, it's a whole education. Can you imagine who does an education for two hours? Can yes, and, we, and, all we're, and we're looking. And, and also, I'll, I'll close on this. Um, something that we've been waiting on for 11 years, because we've done work with him in the southern part of the United States, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Tony Browder. One of the other things about um, the narrative right now is um, about starting in the 70s, the masses of our people in North America started um, protesting and expressing their displeasure about starting our history when our ancestors arrived in chains in Jamestown, Virginia. Some people say 1607, some people say 1619. And uh, a compromise was made. They said when we wanted to start talking about our origin. So the great John Henry Clark creates the Association for Classic African Civilizations. And so, and um, Amheiser Bush, the beer company, um, finances those uh, drawn those images and write-ups in Ebony Magazine, Great Kings and Queens of Africa. But what their intention was was to show that Africa is part of our past and our present, and not our future. Mm -hmm. And not our present, not our future. And this is why when we talk about Eritrea or talk about Ethiopia or talk about Zimbabwe or talk about Mozambique, we say foreign policy as in foreign to us, like Africa might as well be another part of the solar system. This is the manipulation of our desire to learn more about antiquity. Mm. So what we have said to the great Dr. Tony Browder is that we're ready, because we both live in the Washington DC area, but we're ready to finally um, hook up with our brother and do a session for young Africans worldwide called Africa Yesterday, Africa Today, Africa, Africa tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes, and we, we are, we are gonna put loving pressure on him so that we can finally get that done as soon as possible. That is our brother. And we're inspired by his work and um, we've worked together and we'll continue to do so. But every time I'm in his company, I tell him, you know, the time has come for that. The time has come for that. And our plan is to push him as hard to do that as Kwame Ture used to push the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to push for African United Front amongst our organizations. It's very necessary in the decolonization process. And we must come together and do that for the masses of our people. So we're going to be pushing him. We're going to be pushing him to do that. So he can talk about the, the great uh, architects and scientists of yesterday and Kemet. And we'll mm -hmm. talk about how, and then we'll come up and talk about how Gamal Abdul Nasser linked up with Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and uh, saved brother Malcolm's life when the CIA tried to poison him in Kemet. We'll connect the two. He, he'll, he can talk about empires a million years ago in Mali, we'll take it from, we'll we'll talk about Modibe Keita and bring it up to the present. He hmm. can talk about the Munamutapa in Zimbabwe. We'll hmm. talk about Tongo Gara. We'll talk about Chitepo. We'll talk about Mugabe. We'll talk about that. So we'll bring it all together so people understand the parallels and they understand the connection. And that way, that can be a catalyst in changing US EU Africa policy from here on out. Our continent does not exist for um, 
your adventures and your raping and your plundering. That's inherently ours. And we're going to take it back from you and make sure that it stays safe. So African history will continue to save lives and transform lives. That's what we're here to do. So thank you very much. And uh, I exit like I entered with um, respect for all of you and a commit and a commitment to get better at the work we do on your behalf. We thank you. Thank you so very much, brother. And um, blessings out there. I mean, we, we could have stayed even for the next uh, couple of hours, but you know, you have to go because <laughs> no, my, yeah, my yeah, my three-year-old would get upset at you. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Greetings to greetings to Himoha and and his and, beautiful and his beautiful mother as well. I know, I know, of course. Mm. No, no king without a queen, isn't it? <laughs> so thank you so much, and we thank look you. forward to any other updates or comings. Any thank you. Um, that you will want us to know or you want to share with us. We're, we're, one, oh, one more thing. Um, there will be a follow-up. You were there for that historic press conference with yes. the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations. So we're yes. right now working on setting up a meeting between journalists all over the world and mm. Prensa Latina, Cuba's press outlet, so we can build a Pan-African press corps in defense of Cuba. There's just one more question here, please. Get that question. Mm -hmm. I think it's really directed. Bonsoir. What about our African children who speak French? Listen, he's listening from from uh, he, uh, Toronto. And how he do must, they get he, he he must be he must be late because we're teaching a class in Alberta, Canada, on Saturday with people who speak French. So um, if you through if he if he communicates with you, he can get us his contact information. And we'll put him in touch with our sister in Alberta, and she'll make that link a chapter. Beautiful. Yeah, so we mentioned Pierre, that earlier. That... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pierre, you mm -hmm. heard that. So anyone that is interested, you know our WhatsApp number. I think that's the most uh, easiest way Nisha is going to respond to you. And then we will give you the contacts of everywhere that this, um, I mean, all, all across where this program is existing. And we're looking forward to get this program in Europe as soon as possible. We'll yes. make that connection and Nisha is going to come up, come back to you with mm -hmm. questions on this, how we can make that possible. Definitely. So thank you so very much. And um, what more else do you want to say? Just tell us that poem again about Mother Africa, please. The one last one? Please. Yes. I, I could do a new one. I could do another simple one. <laughs> um, we, we have another one called um, No More, No More. And what this deals with is how... Um, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah started a decolonization process of us changing the names of the colonized nations when they became independent, mm. man. So this is called No More, No More. Gold Coast, No More, No More today, it's Ghana. British Tanganyika, No More, No More today, it's Tanzania. Northern Rhodesia, No More, No More today, it's Zambia. Southern Rhodesia, No More, No More today, it's Zimbabwe. Portuguese East Africa, no more, no more today, it's Mozambique. Southwest Africa, no more, no more today, it's Namibia. Upper Volta, no more, no more today, it's Burkina Faso. African colonial names for African nations, no more, no more. African names for African nations, African names for African people, no more, no more, no more, no more. And the one that you wanted us to do um, was the one that we did um, it's called uh, We All Love Our Mother. I'll do it again. I have mm. a lot of sisters. I have a lot of brothers. I have a lot of cousins. I have a lot of uncles. I have a lot of aunties. But we all have the same mother. She's my mother's mother. She's my father's mother. She's my grandparents' mother. She's my great-grandparents' mother. She's my ancestors' mother. The mother that we're talking about is Mother Africa. The mother that we're talking about is Mother Africa. We must defend our mother by standing up for our mother. We must come together in the name of our mother. We all love our mother. We all love our mother. We all love our mother. And each play we've done, we have one or two poems that go with it. So we actually have poems that will be available for the students with the lessons that go with the poems. So mm. we're very prepared. We're very equipped. And, um, you know, we feel that this is the class that many people are looking for at the moment and have been oh, waiting yes. for. So we're just happy, like I said, that we have a chance to promote it on such a magnificent platform. 
Thank you, Bayete, Bayete, Bayete. All the blessings and love you can already see in the comments. And definitely, I think there will be a lot reaching out to us to get these contacts, and we'll get back to you. Thank you yes, so much. Blessings. Okay, Afri okay, African. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Be well. Bye -bye. Wow. Madasa, Madasa. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> do you feel it? Can you feel it, my people, my family? Can you feel it? You know, um, yeah. We are going to take it further. Tomorrow we're celebrating our legend who clocked 85 years, I think two days or three days ago, in the name of Professor Dr. Leonard Jefferson Jr. You all get me right. Flyers are already out. And we're going to be dropping them again tonight on the YouTube community. You know, um, like we are saying, like just our brother was talking a couple of minutes ago, we celebrating the history a long time now, even though they say history. And I like Mama Bello when she say history, history, O-U-R-U, and then story, our story, not his story because his story is their story. So it's our story. So we're gonna be correcting all this, you know, um, not history, it's our story, right? We, we, I just had to learn that also. <laughs> his story, if we look at the words, nothing is done that is not, that is a coincidence. His story about us. So normally we're gonna say our story from us, about us to us for us yeah so a it, it, it's very pertinent it's very um subtle but it has a lot if you say our story then us saying his story okay history is that their own but now we are producing our own story so we're gonna have the our story and what is the our story it's gonna come when we celebrate our legends when they are alive what is our story is actually taking that kind of talents that he's saying and putting it to work for us. What is our story? We want to also start comparing how were the things in ancient Africa? For instance, how did they marry? Okay. Was this spot or this kind of boxing and stuff? Was it existing? What about even our hair and the beard? Why is it that in this time, you know, when, when an African keeps a lucky hair or kinky hair, you don't get a job? What is the essence of them taking away all these things that in ancient history we did? How did we eat? How did we raise children? What are we, what, and we can go through the Proverbs and you would see actually what the spirituality was about. So I think all this our story is really going to go back. I mean, we, we, we would then realize that anything that doesn't belong to the way we were doing it is foreign. Do, 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 do you get this? Anything that doesn't fall into the way our, our forefathers, our ancestors in ancient Egypt or Kemet were living, how they celebrated marriage. Was it, did they really marry the way we we're marrying? You know, how did they look at family? Because how did they raise children? We know the one a, a specific proverbs that say it takes a village to raise a whole child, to raise a child. What was that kind of spirituality telling us? Today, we just use these proverbs. We actually don't break it down. Those are proverbs that were coming from ancient Africa. But what did it signify when they say it takes a village to raise a child? You know, then it signifies the spirituality of who we are, isn't it? So our story can only be when we compare his story and our story, and then we know where it lies. So I want to thank you so much for today. We've already heard a lot, and um, yes, <laughs> thank you. You just came in. You didn't even know what I was drinking water or not coffee. But yes, I, I had to drink the water. I didn't even drink. The topic was so interesting, I couldn't even. You know, so greetings from Tumi Tata and Ia Tata that has been on the panel. Nisha has been also in the chat. Uh, Patrick Kasarim would be coming up on uh, Sunday to give us another um, 
yeah set a uh, feedback from afcon 2022 there's been a lot that has just been going on and we need to also keep in contact with that and that is also part of his story not our story but we'll bring it from our perfect uh, from our point of uh, uh, from our perspective and share this how we see it how it should be our story not his story okay and the funniest thing that i even say her story they say his story and you can see all the patriarchy and all this hierarchy thank you so very much we're going to see ourselves tomorrow thank you for all that has uh, those that have connected and contributed please i have one last thing i know a lot of you in the states don't go by whatsapp what if you start really downloading this app and creating it? Because in a couple of days coming, we'll be building a team from the community that is watching us, particularly the women. We already have noted you since two years that you've been here. You've been asking questions. You've been wanting to be a part, not just wanting. You've been active doing what you're doing, but you want to do more. Kalena Haufer is one. Sainovi Redna is one. Cheryl Penny is one. Johnny Boy is one. We know all of you that have been saying, I want to do something. But you know, it's much easier if you have your WhatsApp, because we're going to build this team who is doing what on the Pan African Daily. You see, and that's why you kept asking. The main thing that we just do was hosting, but now we get to get to that front line and work a little bit more further. You know, some are saying, oh, I want to join the fundraising team. Good, fine. Because in order to say we have our, our sister Bentley, who is also very active. Some are saying we could start creating other content also from our story. Each person bringing something on board so that we can have this chain. I've been saying it a couple of times. I'll continue to say it as a reminder. Please, Cherry Penny, I can't wait for you to have a WhatsApp. We already chatted on this. I'm looking forward. Just a lot of things. Um, Thank you, Sister Sanova. You already had it. We already had a conversation. And uh, Sister Carolina, I have your own. I have your number. Um, uh, Sister Bentley, I have Queen Bentley. I have her own number also. So a lot of us are already. It's not only for the queens. Paul Brown, um, Coffee, I have yours. Abraham, or El Hadi. Ibrahim, yes, I have all yours. If you're looking forward to join that volunteer team, we want to sit and ahead and analyze the conversations and then bring out new ideas, how we can better restructure and who is doing what. And Dr. Susan Tata needs a lot of co-hosts here with us. So all of you that are looking forward to that, please. And we also need content creators of our, uh, of our, of our stories. Create a lot of content and just give it to us to share with the community. Okay. And so we can run our 24-7 after all, we deserve it. Yes, it's our story, not his story. But we're going to study his story and bring out our story. Okay? Yes. So we see ourselves tomorrow, please, with uh, on the celebration of uh, Dr. Jeffries. I mean, this legend, all of us we know, all of us that are Pan-African, and there are a lot of people that are coming to celebrate with, with us as usual, as the family tradition here calls. We don't just celebrate an elder like that alone. So Professor Baina Bello has signed in. Um, Dr. Reverend Ninana has signed in. Um, uh, Baba Jume Faye. I mean, Professor <laughs> James Small. I've been reaching out. King Bongane is going to be a part. He's so honored to be a part. I reach out to Professor Pielo. I reach out to um, uh, King Maponga. They haven't received the invitation. They are, they are, they are, they are, Telephones are completely off. They haven't uh, seen it. I hope to also get um, Elder Tony Jaja, who is coming on the program on Saturday, and we're also going to get a lot. If you want to be a part of this, not just in the background, and you say, I want to officially address my uh, uh, celebrations and my wishes and my regards, and really for me to show my face in, we are uh, calling upon you, send us a, a WhatsApp uh, uh, um a request and we are going to bring you live during that conversation uh, celebration so each uh, participant is gonna apart from the elders 15 minutes 10 minutes five minutes whatever those of you who've been asking they can create poems or you can you know whatever thing you want to do just like we used to do it you want to share a video drop it it shouldn't be long you know um so that we put out there for our legendary 
Yes. And so we're not going to be celebrating ancestors. No, we're going to be celebrating the legends. You know, they have to see the glory. They have to leave it. They have to connect. They have to see their work before they transit, not after. Okay. And that is also our story. It's not history. That's what we've been doing. So thank you so very much. Yes, you all are also beautiful. I hear a lot of people, oh, I love your hair. Nesha say, I love your gorgeous kinky hair. You know, you're looking so beautiful. You too. Thank you so very much. It's amazing. All of us, all of us, all of us are looking that awesomely beautiful. And I like a new name for my followers from the state. And just like he was saying, a couple of people like, oh, did you watch Miss Susan? Do you watch Miss Susan's show? So I love it. Yes. Call me anything. Any Nana F1, um, whatever, Susan, Tata, what, anything, Queen, Ambo, whatever. Give me your name. Give me your own name that you want to call me with. Yes, it's just me. Okay, I take everything. It's one love. I belong to you. You belong to me. So we see ourselves in here tomorrow. Immediately, I drop the flyers on Facebook. And uh, you please make sure you share. Just share. I mean, Dr. Leona. Jefferson's Dr. J, how we call him, deserves it. He has to see his glory, his work physically. He has to feel it. He has done so, so much. And most of these are liberators, this freedom movement. You know how they end up. Everybody always says we end up. We're the poorest people. Of course, because they've never had the, uh, the, 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 the passion of going to look for what. That's why you, we sacrifice and volunteer and work for the nation, right? So the only thing that we can do to them is to honor their work, to appreciate it, to come in in all our numbers, to just show our faces here and say, Baba, thank you so much for more than 50 years. Until today, it, at the age of 85, we still see him. I just talked to him. He's going to a conference uh, with uh, Baba Asukwele. They're always on the move at 85. And believe me, he's going to hit up to 100. And he'll still be doing the other things like his other, our, our other ancestors did. Can you imagine? So even if you work for your nation, you live longer. Don't you know that? If you serve your people, your ancestors uphold you and give you longevity. If you want to try that, start doing it. No sickness, no one would just take you out like that, except your ancestors say, we want to give you rest. If you want to hit 85, and now you're 40, 30, 20, 15, up to, please just join us on the Pan-African Daily. We have work for you to do. You're going to hit that 100. A lot of people don't want to die these days, but you're doing the wrong thing, and you're going to die faster. Work for your people, for your nation. You live longer because your ancestors want you to do that work. They will sustain you like they're sustaining our elders. Get it from me, okay? Thank you so very, very much. And thanks to our Facebook uh, viewers. Um, yes, I see your comments and we've been able to share a lot of them. Thank you so much. We see ourselves tomorrow. And you go ahead and enjoy the Pan-African, you know, dance, the Pan-African song. And I see a lot of people always say, oh, we love this music. Okay, we're going to play it with all our legends and our celebrities for you tonight. So good night. Tomorrow, come in well-loaded to support Baba. Okay, to support Baba, even to bless him like we do with money. We're going to contribute to him tomorrow. It's going to go to him. We're going to ask if they have PayPal or whatever that we will share to support his work, his library, or whatever thing that he needs. And you living in that neighborhood, call often to find out how Baba is doing. Okay? Thank you so very much. We see us tomorrow again. I can say thank you one million times and goodbye one million times. I will still be here. Good night to all of you. Bye. Your Miss Susan. <laughs> You are watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. 
join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.